the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And with my colleague Stephen Rothstein from the Kennedy Foundation, we and all of our colleagues welcome you to the Kennedy Library. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and Gourmet Catering, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. If I can ask an enormous favor of you all, please silence your mobile devices so that they are not disruptive during the program. Thank you. We will be collecting questions in writing throughout the conversation this evening. Our team will be passing through the hall periodically with cards and pencils, and they can collect your questions that way. Tonight, we are honored to welcome His Excellency Juan Manuel Santos, the President of the Republic of Colombia from 2010 to 2018. He was awarded the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize for what the prize committee described as, quote, his resolute efforts to bring the country's more than 50-year-long civil war to an end. He is currently the Angelopoulos Global Public Leaders Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. He has served as Colombia's first foreign trade minister and also served as finance minister and national defense minister. He created the Good Government Foundation, Fundación Buen Gobierno. During his time working as a columnist and deputy director of El Tiempo newspaper, Santos was awarded the King of Spain Prize for Journalism. He was also elected president of the Freedom of Expression Commission for the Inter-American Press Association. I'm also delighted to introduce our moderator for this evening. Ricarda Hausman is director of Harvard's Center for International Development and professor of the practice of economic development at the Kennedy School of Government. Previously, he served as the first chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank, where he created the research department. He also served as Minister of Planning of Venezuela and as a member of the board of the Central Bank of Venezuela. He also served as chair of the IMF World Bank Development Committee. His research interests include issues of growth, macroeconomic stability, international finance, and the social dimensions of development. Please join me in welcoming our special guest this evening. Uh, good evening, good evening, and thank you for coming uh, to this uh, um, conversation with President Santos. I first met President Santos when he was Minister of Foreign Trade of Colombia, and I was Minister of Planning. Um, uh, he then went on to become Minister of Finance when I was the Chief Economist of the Inter-American Development Bank. Then he went on to become Minister of Defense. In between, he created a foundation on good governance. Uh, after being Minister of Defense, uh, he became President of Colombia. Um, when we first met, um, there were many Colombians migrating towards Venezuela because we had a higher standard of living, better living conditions, and so on. Uh, these days, Venezuelans are massively going towards Colombia. Now, obviously, uh, that is in part due to some things that we did wrong in Venezuela. But the fact that they're going to Colombia is an indication that you did something right in Colombia. So with that perspective of the last, say, 27 years or so, uh, what went right in Colombia? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. This marvelous place, uh, inspiring place, inspired by a great president, John Kennedy. And thank you, Ricardo, for being the, the, uh, my companion in this conversation. 
Colombia in the last uh, years has had a very positive transformation. Um, well, we, we've been doing uh, sort of a set of reforms since we met. When I was Minister of Trade, that's when Venezuela and Colombia opened their economies. We were very close economies. But then I'll go uh, back to 2010 when I became uh, president. Well, uh, we started the peace process. We can talk about that uh, later on. But at the same time, uh, we wanted to make a series of reforms. I had, uh, in, in a way, uh, the idea of something similar to what President Kennedy and then President Johnson did on terms of the social investment, the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and we started to uh, have a, a Congress pass reforms, approve reforms, which were very important. For example, in the last eight years, uh, we made access to our health system a fundamental right, and we now have universal coverage. We made uh, education uh, free for every boy and girl in Colombia from kindergarten to the 11th grade, and uh, we increased substantially the access to higher education. And for the first time, we put education on top of our budget. Usually, for the last 100 years, uh, defense and security were the number one. Well, we changed that. We put education as number one. We made a very ambitious uh, program for uh, modernizing our infrastructure. Um, and uh, we have right now in place a real revolution in terms of modernizing our highways, our ports. Uh, if you go, I don't know how Last time you went to Bogota, you arrived to the airport, which is the most modern airport in the whole of Latin America, number one in cargo, number three in passengers after Mexico and uh, Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, we put in place some programs that uh, allowed us to improve substantially um, our social indicators. For example, our fight against poverty. Um, we innovated there. I had a, a professor um, in Harvard who won the Nobel uh, Prize in economics. Uh, he comes from India, Amartya Sen, um, who had a very different idea of measuring progress, measuring prosperity, very similar very similar, and I brought a, a part of his, of his uh, speech, very similar to what Robert Kennedy had at that time. I went to the University of Kansas uh, in 1969. In March of 1968, uh, Robert Kennedy went to the University of Kansas, and I, I have here a part of his speech, and did, said the following. I want to read it to you because it's very inspiring. He said, even if we act to erase material poverty, there is another great task, greater task. It is to confront poverty of satisfaction, purpose, and dignity that afflicts us all. Too much for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross, our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, the gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and counts nuclear warheads 
and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whit Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross, the gross national product does not allow for the health, for health of our children, the quality of their education or, their, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which ma makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America except why we are proud that we are Americans. That, that was very similar to what uh, Professor Sen was teaching. And so I called him and I said, Professor Sen, I want to apply your theory in my country. And he said, okay, come to Oxford. And I took the presidential plane and flew to Oxford. And he set up a, a group of his uh, uh, advisors and his uh, people who worked with him, went back to Colombia, and we established something called a multi-dimensional poverty index. And we approved laws in Congress and made reforms and created the institutions and started fighting poverty, measuring these type of, of uh, basic necessities that people uh, needed to be satisfied. And that allow, allowed us to, for, to invest uh, our social expenditure with a much higher return socially. And that's why Colombia, in relative terms, have brought down poverty and extreme poverty and inequality, which is a problem for all of Latin America, more than other countries in our region. So in all of, all of this, we have tried to do with what we call fiscal responsibility. You know better than, uh, than me and than anybody, because you're an economics professor, how to maintain the confidence in your economy and maintain the confidence, confidence of, of investors in order to be able to grow is one of the necessary conditions. So, in, to, to summarize, Colombia has had a responsible macro, uh, policy, macroeconomic policy, and at the same time, a very aggressive social policy. That has allowed us to, to uh, perform much better than Venezuela. I will tell you an anecdote uh, which comes to the point that you were asking. I was a very harsh critic of Chavez. Um, when I got elected, he even told my predecessor that if I got elected, there would be war with Colombia. Well, um, when I got elected, I decided to try to make peace with our neighbors because we didn't have at that time uh, diplomatic relations uh, with uh, Venezuela or Ecuador. We had very bad relations with Brazil, uh, no trade relations. And so I made peace with, uh, with uh, Chavez. And uh, I told him, let's do what President Reagan told Gorbachev when they met in Geneva. And when President Reagan told Gorbachev, I will never be a communist and you will never become a capitalist. But let's work together for a superior objective, which is at that, in that conversation to reduce the nuclear arsenal. And I said to Chavez, I will never become a Bolivarian revolutionary and you will never become a liberal democrat but let's work together for peace. Peace in Colombia, which is also peace in Venezuela and peace in the region. And he said yes. And he started criticizing 
my economic model, my development model, and I said, uh, let's not discuss our economic models and our development models. Let history judge us some years uh, from now. Well, I think history has made a very, very important judgment uh, comparing Venezuela to Colombia. Uh, people are coming to Colombia also not only because of the terrible situation that unfortunately you're going through the Venezuelans, um, but also because uh, uh, Colombia is now offering them what Venezuela offered us for many, many years, a better future, um, freedom, uh, democracy with all its, uh, uh, its problems, but uh, we, we have a, a, a democracy that we have to strive to strengthen every day, uh, and that's what we're trying to recover in Venezuela, because unfortunately, you did away with, or Maduro did away with democracy, and uh, that's why we have to all keep the pressure to see if we can uh, uh, put Venezuela again in the democratic path. Venezuela is a very rich country, a great country with great people, and they don't deserve what they're going through at this time. Thank you. L let me ask you, if you, if you were to, you know, in your hat, not just as, as, as a former president, but a former minister of finance and so on, what were, so like if you say, uh, a lesson of history, do this topic this way like Colombia and not this way like Venezuela? What were the mistakes that were done in Venezuela and the correct policies that were done in Colombia? If you well, could name a few. In Colombia, we, we applied what uh, we call, some, some, some of us call, the, the, the third way. Um, that's what I would say uh, Bill Clinton did here in the U.S., what Tony Blair did in the U.K., what Fernando Enrique Cardoso did in Brazil, or uh, Ricardo Lagos in Chile. You, you summarize the third way in a phrase that will that says more or less that you allow the markets to perform until they are able to perform, but you intervene, the state intervenes when it's necessary to correct whatever markets are not doing or when the markets do not work. And this pragmatic combination has allowed the countries that have applied this third way to have a period of prosperity that is much more important than other periods in their economic history. In Venezuela, the approach was completely different. It's, the state has to do everything. The state has to control everything. And not only uh, in economic terms, in political terms. So freedom, which is for me a sacred word, uh, was sacrificed in Venezuela. And when you sacrifice freedom and you don't allow the private initiative and uh, innovation and uh, uh, the good ideas to flourish, uh, you will simply destroy uh, whatever you have. And this is what hap has happened in Venezuela. Plus, if you allow corruption to take over, well, then you make things uh, worse. And unfortunately, in Venezuela, they also allowed to corruption, corruption to take over a system that was uh, doomed from the beginning because they were on the wrong track. Yeah, very interesting. Let's move on now. You got the Nobel Prize in, for peace. So before we talk about peace, let's talk about war. Uh, Colombia had a civil war that was 50 some uh, years long. Uh, what in your mind was the cause of the war and maybe not just the cause of the war, but why, what made it so long lasting? 
Well, Colombia has been a very violent country since our independence. We have had more civil wars than any other country in Latin America. This specific war with the FARC uh, started in the early 60s when two things uh, were present at the same time. In the early 60s, uh, you had all these revolutionary movements, the Cuban Revolution and uh, the communist uh, revolutions, in, uh, and so you had uh, the guerrilla movements, not only in Colombia, in, also in Venezuela, in, in, many, in many countries. But in Colombia, after our only military dictatorship, um, that in order to topple this dictatorship that fortunately lasted very, a very short amount of time, the two main political parties decided to share power and share everything. And they, the half of the cabinet was liberal, half of the cabinet was conservative. All the positions the government half and half, uh, and they excluded everybody else. So the revolutionary movements plus the exclusion of what we, co we called at that time the National Front gave uh, the correct environment for the FARC to, to flourish. And uh, also we neglected for many, many years, and we still are neglecting, uh, the development in the rural areas. And this, is, this was a rural guerrilla, uh, a peasant guerrilla, and uh, that uh, when the guerrilla movements started to fade away or to win in other countries, um, in Colombia, unfortunately, uh, something arrived that uh, has been a terrible problem for us, terrible headache, which is drug trafficking. So the FARC discovered this uh, uh, golden hen <laughs> of the drug trafficking to finance their war. So that gave them an extra uh, muscle. And so they were able to last 50 years. And, and their, their idea was a communist, uh, revolution and their, their uh, flag was uh, social justice. Uh, that's the origin. But from there, they started to, to evolve. Uh, unfortunately, they got into drug trafficking uh, and uh, so their I ideals were started to change. So, um by the way, before we go on to, to the continuation of war and peace, maybe you could tell us a little bit your thoughts about uh, to what extent uh, uh, this world war on drugs uh, for, that caused so much havoc in, in Colombia. Uh, any thoughts on was this the right way to face the drug issue? Uh, what was historically, if you you have any comments on was it inevitable that that it should have proceeded that way, or were there other ways in which, uh, if you were to, if you are now to act on drug policy, how would you what would your drug policy be? Well, I will tell you an anecdote. Um, I am a very uh, very keen uh, reader of biographies. The latest biography of Winston Churchill. It's a bit long, it's a bit more over a thousand pages, but it's the best one. Has a story that during Prohibition, Winston Churchill came to the US through Canada, to California. And he arrived and he asked for a drink. And uh, they said, no, Mr. Churchill, we." drink is prohibited in this country. And he said, what a strange country this is. Uh, you allow the huge profits of the sale of liquor to go to the mafias. 
in my country, we give it to the treasury. <laughs> uh, that's my answer. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, uh, let, let's go now. So, you have this guerrilla movement. It's there. It's outside of the constitutional rules. I mean, you changed the constitution in 1991, I believe. Uh, you know, um, that system that justified the creation of the guerrilla was changed. You became a more open democracy and so on. But the guerrillas continued. Um, so here you are. They appoint you minister of defense. Uh, what's your strategy? How do you deal with them? Well, I go back. I was seeing the, and they were showing me around and how uh, President Kennedy was a sailor. And uh, I was in the Navy also. And I, I learned when in the Navy how to sail. And the first lesson that they gave me, the officer that was in charge said, uh, Santos, he gave me a small sailboat, go and learn how to sail. And that was very difficult. I, I didn't know what to do, and uh, I really got in problems. And he said, I'll teach, you, I'll teach you something which is going to be very important to you, not only to learn how to sail, but in your life, um, in everything that has to do with your future. You always need to know where you want to go. And in sailing, if you have like a port of destination, you can use all the winds, no matter how strong they are, or if they're against you, you can use them to arrive to that port of destination. That was a very good lesson that many, many years later, in a conversation I had with Nelson Mandela, I was the chairman of the UNTAD, the United Nations Conference of Trade and Development, and he got elected uh, chair, chairman after me. So I went to Johannesburg and I gave him uh, the chair. That morning, I was in the hotel in Johannesburg and I turned on the television and I saw the most incredible live program. Um, there were the victims of the war with the perpetrators live in television confronting each other. Some of them embraced, others screamed at each other and I, I couldn't understand and uh, I had a 15 minute meeting with Mandela program that afternoon. I went uh, and I asked him, what is it that was seen this morning television? And that 15 minute became five hours of conversation about peace. And at the end, he said, your country will never progress if you don't end the war. And then I discovered that at that time that that was going to be my port of destination. That was the early 90s. So when I became Minister of Defense, I already knew that we needed peace. But to have a successful peace process, you need to have the right conditions, the necessary conditions. And one of them was to weaken the FARC, to convince them that through violence, they will never achieve their objectives. They will never win. And so you have to be uh, successful militarily in order to take them to the negotiating table. And so when I uh, arrived, as a, when I was appointed Minister of Defense, I knew that I had to be successful if I wanted to take them to the negotiating table. So I had to become a very effective hawk. And I was elected president in the year 2010 because I was a war hero. And when you're a war hero, uh, you, you exercise a very easy type of leadership. In, terms, in, in times of war, you give orders, um, you rally the forces around you, and you, you point at the, at the enemy, your adversaries, and you say, let's go together 
and uh, against our enemies. That is easy. But then I had to become a dove, and that is much more difficult. That's why I say it's much more difficult to make peace than to make war. Because to make peace, the type of leadership is not vertical, it's horizontal. Instead of giving orders, you have to persuade. You have to convince uh, the victims of the, war, of the conflict to forgive and to tell a, a mother of, of two kids or a daughter that had been raped and killed uh, to forgive the perpetrators, that is much more difficult. And to heal the wounds of 50 years of war takes a lot of time. But I always knew that the, being effective in the middle, in, as a Minister of Defense was necessary to be able to sit down and have a serious negotiation. Um, so when I was a Minister of Defense, I also learned a very important lesson uh, about how to wage an effective war. When I came into to the ministry, we were having, uh, we had copied military strategies and uh, we had a terrible way of measuring the effectiveness of our officers. Uh, we copied that from Vietnam, the body count. How many bodies do you have? And that's what the generals and colonels were measured by. And that is a very bad way to measure the effectiveness of a, 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 an officer. And one general who had, been, had retired, very intelligent uh, historian, when I was recently appointed as Minister of Defense, he said to me, uh, uh, Minister Santos, you, you're going to have to wage war, lead the war against the FARC. But don't treat them as your enemies. Treat them as your adversaries. Enemies you destroy. Your adversaries you, you beat. And you're going to have to live with them for the rest of your life. I know that you want peace. So uh, treat them as, as uh, sons of the same nation. You're, they are your brothers. Humanize the war, and that will give you much more respect and will give the military more respect from the population. Our military were, in the, were blacklisted in, in many of the, of the list in, the, in human rights uh, in Geneva and in, in New York. So we made a, a radical change and for example, instead of a body count, I start saying, I will measure your performance by the number of guerrillas that give up, give their arms, to, that reincorporate into civil society. And we did some very audacious um, uh, programs, uh, uh, put in place very audacious policies, like for example, we, we asked we identified the mothers and the fathers of many of the guerrillas and asked them to write a message to their sons or daughters. And we put uh, these messages in some, uh, uh, some uh, balls that, uh, that floated in the rivers that uh, flowed down to where the guerrillas were concentrated in the Amazon jungle. And this became for them uh, a tremendous uh, incentive to go and see if their mother or their father had sent them a message. And afterwards, when I negotiated with them after the peace process, said, you cannot imagine how it, it was much harder for us uh, as commanders, uh, in the morale of our people, what you did with these messages. And we also put some, some, some lights in, in the trees, in the jungle, during Christmas with messages from the fathers, mothers, or sisters of the guerrillas, and uh, we left. 
and then the guerrillas came and they all w competed to see uh, who, who had the message. And the, 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 the effect on the war of humanizing the war was much uh, higher, much more, had a much bigger impact than, than bombing uh, the camps and, and killing everybody. Uh, so that is a, a human way to win a war. And that allowed me afterward to sit down in a much better environment to negotiate peace. So when did you decide to move from war to peace? When I got elected president. Um, because uh, I had identified, um, I had identified the conditions that were necessary. I, I used uh, a lot of the lessons that I learned here at Harvard. Uh, negotiation lesson, lessons, uh, the first lessons I took was from uh, a professor called Roger Fisher. One of his pupils, William Uri, I brought in as a special advisor for the negotiations since the very beginning. Um, and uh, I also used um, the lessons of a marvelous professor whose 100th anniversary was just recently celebrated, Richard Neustadt. Mm -hmm. Vice President Gore was there in the, in the celebration of his 100th anniversary. And I studied all the peace processes that have been negotiated. What was applicable to our, our process and what was not? What lessons could we learn? And so in that process, I discovered a series of conditions that were necessary. And one of them was that in today's world, asymmetric wars need the support of the region and if possible of the international community. We were going to negotiate peace under the umbrella of the Rome Statute, which is an international treaty that was negotiated to facilitate uh, negotiations. And those conditions were not present until I became president when I made peace, for example, with Chavez or with Correa. Um, in order to be able to have the necessary conditions to have a successful peace process. So I switched from hawk to dove when I became president. And uh, so tell us a little bit more. So you, you decided to go uh, to a negotiation. Uh, what was your initial strategy? What, what was, uh, how did you conceive of the negotiating process? Okay. In this process of learning from other processes, and all my predecessors had tried to make peace since, since 1882. All of the presidents in Colombia had tried and had failed. So I started to study why had they failed, what, what was lacking. Um, the first thing that I, that I learned, not only from our own failures, but from other peace processes, that you need a very short and uh, concrete agenda. I learned that the, the less public your negotiations, especially at the beginning, the better. So we negotiated secretly for two years the agenda. And until we had the agenda, which is almost 50% of the negotiations defined, then we went public. We went to Oslo and made the agenda public. I learned that uh, the military were very important to be part of the process. All my predecessors thought that the military would be uh, spoilers of the process. But I, I, um, I also learned that uh, there's a very famous phrase of General MacArthur who said, uh, if you think that the military like war, you don't understand the military. The soldiers are the ones who risk their lives. They are the ones that are the most interested in having peace. And I knew uh, 
because I was mil I was in the military, and so I talked their 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 language. So I brought them in. Two of my chief negotiators chief negotiators were the two most popular generals that Colombia had: police and army. And uh, so all these conditions could not be sort of created until I was president. That's why the switch was made when I became president. Two years of secret negotiations, and then we start the public negotiations. Another very difficult decision that I took was because during the Ministry of Defense, we had, uh, we had been able to get the upper hand in the military balance of power with the guerrillas. And uh, because the guerrillas had always taken advantage of the negotiations to increase their military and their political power, I studied the peace processes in Israel and Palestine. And I remembered a strategy that uh, Prime Minister Rabin from Israel had applied when he sat down with Arafat. And he said, I will negotiate with terrorism, which was Arafat, as if there is no terrorism. But I will continue to fight terrorism as if there is no peace process. So I told the, the FARC, I'm going to apply the same doctrine. We will, we will sit down and negotiate, but we continue the war. They wanted a ceasefire, but I did not want a ceasefire until I knew that we could get an agreement. It's very risky. It brought me a lot of problems because people don't understand, why are you talking to these people while they're committing all these atrocities? But in the long run, it's the most effective way to get a result. What, what, what was your initial thoughts of what you were going to find the FARC in the negotiation, and what did you learn about the FARC through the negotiation process? Well, they, in a way, uh, were getting older, the commanders, and Another condition that was necessary was to convince the commanders that it's in their own personal advantage to negotiate and not to continue the war. When I became Minister of Defense, 45 years of war and not one single member of what they call the Secretariat, the, like the Board of Directors, had been captured or killed. Not one single one in 45 years. Uh, they had penetrated all our intelligent uh, uh, agencies. So um, I went to a friend of mine, which was the Prime Minister of Great Britain at that time, and I told him, uh, please help me. And he said, what do you need? I said, I need you to help me in what you are the best in the world, intelligence. So. He uh, got the phone and dialed uh, uh, the phone number of a marvelous man called Sir John Scarlett. He was the head of MI6, British intelligence. He said, I, I, had a, I have a friend of mine. Uh, I want you to help him. I went to his uh, building. It's a building with no address. Um, and I had a crash course in intelligence for two days. Incredible crash course that said you need to change your intelligence, you need to change uh, the way the intelligence operates. Your intelligence is modeled by the Americans, and the Americans have their agencies compete, FBI against the CIA, against the DEA, they all compete. That won't work in Colombia, that doesn't work in Colombia because your, your intelligence is, by, is made by the different forces and they are military or police and they don't have the flexibility. You have to have a system like we have, concentrated under the office of the prime minister, in this case on the office of the president. This change uh, 
made our intelligence much more effective, and we started uh, taking down the, what we call the high-value targets. And I had to make very difficult decisions. Uh, for example, one day I was uh, in, in having dinner and with, with the, I remember the, the uh, board of directors of Conservation International, environmental uh, uh, NGO, and uh, the commander of the army called me and said, we have located the number one person in FARC, the commander. We've been going after him for 40 years or 30 years. And, and uh, I had to take a decision. I had already started the peace process, but the rules of the game were the Rabin doctrine. So I had to take the decision right there. Do I authorize an operation against him? This could simply erase the peace process forever. Or uh, do I withhold and tell the military, no, you, don't, you can't go after him, which could uh, mean that the military would be very frustrated and their support for the peace process uh, would, uh, would be weakened. Well, I took the decision to authorize the operation um, because I had told the FARC, it is legitimate for you to want to kill me, in those, in those words, and it is legitimate for me to continue the war against you. And they had accepted. So I said, go after him, he was killed. And uh, afterwards, the FARC told me, it hurt us a lot. You are an SOB, but we respect you for that. And that helped the trust that was necessary in their case to, to be built in order to be able to get an agreement. I learned that uh, also like, I, like humanizing the, the military, the war, also humanizes your adversaries. So they're human beings with, with sons, with uh, families. And, and that, that allows you to, to start speaking a different language with a different attitude. Um, of course, we were miles apart in the way we thought about the future of the country. Uh, but slowly, uh, I realized that uh, their, what they were asking for was not that, that important uh, if you weighed uh, the concessions they wanted, uh, they wanted uh, to have a, a, a representation in Congress. They wanted to be uh, uh, forgiven for their, for their uh, crimes. And I said, uh, the base will be forgiven, not the leaders. The leaders will be judged, sentenced, and condemned. There will be no impunity because the Rome Statute will not allow the impunity. Uh, they wanted uh, to have some reforms in the rural areas that are, were exactly the same that, the, the, that were needed for, for, for the country. So I said, okay, that I can accept. So I discovered that there was not that huge differences in what their expectations were and what we could give. And that facilitated the the negotiations a lot. Why did it take so long? How long did it take? It, take, it took six years of negotiations. And uh, this is a very good question. Um, when people ask me, what would you have done differently? One of the things I would have done differently is instead of, we, we negotiated five points in the agenda. And we decided to negotiate in a, in a sequence. Uh, we have to um, agree on the first point to go to the second point. That was a mistake. We should have negotiated simultaneously because time, and that is a lesson that I learned afterwards, goes against the government, not against the guerrillas. And 
because everything that happens in negotiation will cost the government or the person in, 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 in the st representing the state will cost him politically, especially when you are negotiating in the middle of the war. And uh, that cost me a, l a lot of my political capital because it went on too long. And, but that's a good, a good question. They knew that and they stalled. And they, uh, they were slow in taking decisions and there I would have done it differently. Um, very good. In this country there is a huge debate on health care. Um, there's, uh, you know, in this country, health care, most health care is, health insurance is provided by employers, and then when people switch jobs, it generates uh, uncertainty and so on. Um, uh, it's very expensive. Uh, it's been on the political agenda for a long time. Um, Colombia made a major, major healthcare reform. Uh, can you tell us very, the lessons? Very shortly. It's, what we did was we, we passed a constitutional amendment saying access to the health system is a fundamental right. No hospital can deny access to any Colombian who goes there sick. Uh, we also, they were a system that was subsidized and a system that was by contributions. We decided to uh, put the passengers of second class as passengers of first class. And we chose the treatments that were uh, included in, in the system. Um, I think we, we overdid it. Our system is too expensive. And so we have a system today that measured by international standards, they have three, three ways of measuring the health system. How, what percentage of the population is covered? In the case of Colombia, universal coverage. How many treatments are included in the system? In the case of Colombia, very, uh, very high amount of treatment, very large amount of treatments. And what percentage of the family income goes to health? We have one of the lowest in the world. So we are very well rated in our health system. Of course, we have terrible problems in, in, in the quality of the system. We have, to, uh, we have to improve that, and we might have to reduce the number of treatments. But, uh, Ricardo, I think uh, I am the journalist here. Uh, you're <laughs> not the journalist, and I, <laughs> and I think many people here would like to hear about Venezuela. Uh, you're from Venezuela. You are the expert of Venezuela. Uh, can I ask you some questions about Venezuela? No. Okay, he won no trampa. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, at, at this moment, uh, you've been you've been uh, very much involved in in the future of Venezuela, the D-Day. Could you give us a, a summary of? Uh, what you think will be needed to recover a country that has been destroyed uh, in many respects, institutionally and the productive, productive sector, w what will it take? Well, uh, uh, let me take a short seven hour stretch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, first of all, uh, the catastrophe in Venezuela is really uh, orders of magnitude uh, bigger than anything that we've seen pretty much anywhere, uh, certainly nowhere in this continent. Uh, in the U.S. Great Depression, GDP fell by 29%. Uh, uh, that is the biggest, I mean, that was a historic event. People think that they know a, a, re a depression because they went through the Great Recession of 2008-2009. That saw a decline in GDP of 3%. The Great Depression was 29%. Venezuela had two times the Great Depression by 2018. Between 2013 and 2018, it was 
a collapse of twice the Great Depression. And in 2019, the expectation is that it will be a 30% decline in GDP. So it will be another Great Depression, sort of like three Great Depressions. So, so, so I, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you speak. I'll let you speak afterwards. You, 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 Continue, continue. No, no, you are the journalist so anyway. So, um, so the collapse is, is enormous. This collapse has essentially two causes, and it's the two things that we need to fix. The first one is that Venezuelans have been disempowered from any rights. You were mentioning before, you have no right to own, things can be expropriated from you with no justification and mostly no compensation. Uh, you don't have the right to import, you don't have the right to buy foreign exchange, you don't have the right to set prices. You, have, or you don't even have the right to decide who you sell things to. Uh, or so, so you have a society that has been disempowered. People have needs. Some people would like to make a living out of supplying those needs. They don't have the rights to do that. So, and this all happened when the price of oil was still above 100. Um, so the system was undermining uh, the basic economy. The second thing uh, that happened is that in that period where you, they disempowered society, they'd say, well, you know, if production declines, it's not a problem because we can import. And imports went up by a lot because the price of oil was high, but in addition, they borrowed enormously and they were spending as if the price of oil was at 200 when it was at 100. So at some point in time, capital markets said, we don't lend to this country anymore. So they couldn't borrow that amount, and that's what triggered the initial recession. And then the price of oil collapsed. So now there's a shortage of foreign exchange, so there's no raw materials, no intermediate inputs, no spare parts. So people cannot produce, they cannot plant, so there's no seeds, no fertilizers, no agrochemicals. Uh, there are no spare parts, so there's no transportation. There are no buses, there are no trucks, there's no cars, there's no motorcycles, because... But let me ask you a, a yeah. specific question. Pompeo, the Secretary of State, was in Cucuta, Colombia, just two days ago. Yes. And he said, the recovery of Venezuela will cost about six to ten billion do uh, dollars. Do you think uh, with ten billion dollars you can reconstruct Venezuela? I, I think he was off by a zero or so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if he were right, uh, if he could do that, uh, he would deserve the Nobel Prize in economics because he will have discovered a way to solve the problems of the world for a tenth of their cost. But it will be very, very expensive to recover the country, but I sense that there's a lot of willingness to help Venezuela recover. Um, but I... To what extent, and... and Forgive me for asking this question, but uh, you're a Venezuelan and you've been very involved. Uh, to what extent the uh, political use of the Venezuelan drama has been, in a way, uh, a bad thing for the finding a solution? Uh, um, what we saw, for example, with the humanitarian aid and uh, both president of the United States, the president of Colombia, using that politically for their own electorate here. Uh, do you think that it has been good or it has been bad? Well, I think that in this country, there's broad bipartisan support for um, the restoration of democracy in Venezuela. And, uh, you know, you've seen, you've seen statements on both sides of, of the aisle. So I, I hope this does not become partisan in the U.S. because this is really an issue of a democracy and human rights and freedom, uh, the, the restoration of the Constitution. And that's some, it's an area where both Democrats and, and Republicans uh, you know, share values. So I certainly hope that um, it becomes, um, it, it, it remains a, 
uh, an issue with broad uh, bipartisan support. I mean, you know, it has the support, the enthusiastic support of, of, Pres of Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada. It has, you know, broad support of all along. Yes. Of, all along. So I think that that broad coalition is something that we need to keep together. And uh, the thing that enough pressure on the armed forces for them to return to the Constitution. They are allowing President Maduro to violate the Constitution, to usurp power, uh, to govern without uh, the authorization of the National Assembly, without uh, any respect to the Constitution. Uh, they should just go back to the Constitution. And, and, and uh, you can convince them by forcing them to repress you by putting your people in danger every day to go to the streets to protest, by, by uh, appealing to their humanity, by negotiating their future role in society. Uh, but, you know, what you said about, uh, about the FARC is that uh, the reason why they negotiated is because they were under threat. And, and, uh, and we don't have that instrument. We cannot threaten them. They are armed, we're not armed. So, so it makes the, the negotiation or the process difficult because, and, and you're also unable to promise them much because you have nothing to give and you have no credibility in being able to deliver on any, any promises you make. So, so that's why it's hard without international involvement to to change the situation. Well, now let me get back to my role as moderator. <laughs> um, uh, let me see. Uh, well, this is a, let's start with an easy one. My name is Juan David Gutierrez and I am originally from Armenia, Colombia. Uh, this is the first time I verbalize that I am proud of a Colombian president because of you. Thank you for bringing Colombia back to a positive conversation. My question relates to the impact of the peace process. Historically oppressed and marginalized communities in Colombia. In essence, I'm talking about Afro-Colombian and indigenous groups who have certainly been the most affected by the conflict. How to challenge dominant narratives of hate? Very good question. Mm -hmm. um, The peace has two faces, two sort of trenches. First is what they call peacemaking, which is the one that we already uh, delivered. We made peace, we signed the agreement, the FARC gave up their arms, the arms went to the United Nations, they were destroyed, the FARC are now a political party, and their members are being reincorporated into society. The other part is peace building, which is even more difficult than peacemaking. I will tell you an anecdote. Um, one of my big allies in the peace process was the Pope. And uh, I used to go visit him, and I used to tell him, uh, uh, Your Holiness, why don't you go to Colombia and give me a push? I need it. <laughs> and, and he smiled and said, I will go to Colombia when you, most, when you will most need me. And he went to Colombia, a historic visit, after the peace process had already been signed, after the arms had been de destroyed. And he went in a visit that he himself baptized as, I'm going to Colombia to give a push to the Colombians to take the first step towards, and this is the magic words, towards reconciliation. Reconciliation uh, with the victims, reconciliation among Colombians that have been hating each other for so many years, reconciliation with all those uh, vulnerable sectors of society that because of the war had been neglected, 
and even reconciliation with the environment because the war uh, has also terrible effects in our biodiversity and Colombia is one of the most one of the richest countries in the world in terms of the environment and biodiversity so what has happening right now what is happening and and some reforms have been approved is to give the, give this a, a vulnerable sectors of society much more space and give and and guarantee their rights for example the indigenous people um, the, the indigenous communities we have been giving them uh, more autonomy in their health systems in their education systems um, in their their special uh, justice that they they apply and this is a, a process that is is going on and now that we have peace uh, this should accelerate so it's it's a process that it's starting and thanks to the peace process this is something that is now possible uh, very good I have a question here from Juan Miguel he asks essentially uh, why is Colombia why was Colombia so divided about the peace agreement that is a good question and uh, peace processes always have enemies you study any peace process uh, I remember President Clinton telling me that he uh, that he mentioned this anecdote in the the funeral of McGuinness, one of the leaders of the Northern Ireland uh, peace process, that in the middle of the peace process in South Africa, Mandela called Clinton and uh, he said, Mr. President, uh, they are really destroying me. The criticism is, is very harsh. And he said, well, this is a to be expected the apartheid people don't don't like you because no 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 it's my own people the ones that are 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 criticizing me peace if you if you have to define where what is the difficult decision is where do you draw the line between peace and justice and no matter where you draw it you will have people dissatisfied from both sides. Uh, me, people who don't understand the concept of transitional justice, this is a, a, a different type of justice that is applied to peace processes like the Colombians, where the perpetrators of uh, war crimes don't go to a normal jail. They are sanctioned to repair the rights of the victims. Um, and this is difficult to understand by many people. Also, Many people uh, take advantage politically of this dissatisfaction from both sides. And I tell you, uh, there's a professor in, in California called Jared Diamond, who is very well known, uh, and he went to Colombia. And he said, uh, I want to see the president. And I, I, I uh, said, of course. And he went and said, Mr. President, I congratulate you. And I said, why? Because everybody hates you. <laughs> uh, and I said, what do you mean? And, and uh, he said, I've been talking to both sides. Both sides are dissatisfied. That means that the agreement that they made is a good agreement. And mm -hmm. so it takes time for people to appreciate the benefits of peace and to heal the wounds that so many years of war have produced. Uh, well, it's been less than a year now, but is it holding? Oh yes, this this process is irreversible. Um, nobody in, in his right mind can think that the FARC will go back to the mountain. Uh, they have surrendered their arms. They are now reintegrated into politics and uh, in normal life. Uh, the problem with the or the yeah the problem with the peace process in Colombia is it's probably the most comprehensive peace process ever negotiated. And I don't, I don't say this, uh, the, all the experts say it. There are two elements who are very, uh, that are very 
uh, sui generis. A very sophisticated transitional justice system, and it's the first time that the, the peace process uh, agrees on developing plans for all the regions that were affected by the conflict, which has 15 years to be complied with. People are very anxious that when is it that the road is going to come, when is it the, the, the school is going to be built, and there, uh, well, that is going to take some time. But uh, the process itself is irreversible, and legally, there's something which pe some people forget. Our constitutional court made a ruling that no president, no Congress, for the next three presidential periods can approve a law that will go against the compliance of the agreement. I have uh, two questions here that have an international flavor. Uh, one comes from Bilbao, Spain, where you, you've known the, the problems they've had with ETA and nationalist terrorism. The uh, question is this, is it worth to sacrifice justice for peace? I would like to hear your personal point of view. Uh, um, and so that's, that's the first question for coming from uh, justice versus peace. And the second one is, is um, you spoke of defeating FARC and commencing a peace process with them. What advice in, 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 would you give to the leaders of Israel? Well, <laughs> the, the instructions I gave my negotiators was go and negotiate as much justice as you can that will allow peace to be made. Um, and uh, among the negotiators, there was an American negotiator, a professor from the University of Notre Dame. His name was Douglas Castle, expert in human rights. And his role in the negotiation was, I want to comply with our own constitution and with international law. So everything that we negotiated from the justice point of view uh, is a sacrifice for the people that are accustomed to normal justice, but it's within the range of the acceptable justice uh, in today's world. The International Crim Criminal Court was the product of the Rome Statute, and the International Criminal Court says what we negotiated uh, is sufficient to uh, guarantee that there will be, there will be no impunity especially for the most responsible of war crimes and cr crimes against, society, uh, against uh, uh, humanity. humanity. What uh, advice would I give the leaders of Israel? Well, first, uh, to stop advancing in those things that are making this the two-state solution viable. If you continue advancing with the settlements, if you continue uh, taking land um, like uh, what is happening with the Golan Heights, um, uh, you, will, you, will, um, you will make any peace agreement much more difficult. Um, uh, I think, like in any peace agreement, you need to sit down, uh, and if there's the will and uh, it should not be that difficult because other uh, attempts have almost defined uh, the two-state solution. If there is the will, I think that it will be possible. Uh, Here is a topic we haven't discussed yet tonight. Uh, it says uh, corruption has plagued the governments of all developing countries. Uh, what are you your ideas on how to combat it, how to control it, how to deal with it? I think the best antidote that uh, any society can have against corruption is education. A, a society that, a society that, that is well educated would be much more 
resistant to leaders that are corrupt and to corruption in general. Um, you can also increase uh, the, the penalties uh, like we have done in Colombia in many countries, um, uh, but, but it's, it's uh, the values, the principles, education uh, that in the long run will uh, be uh, the best deterrent for corruption. Uh, there is a, an initiative that a judge here in Boston, Judge Wolf, uh, I was, I chaired, I chaired with, uh, with uh, the then Prime Minister of, of Great Britain, with Desmond Cameron, the first uh, World Summit, an anti-corruption World Summit in London. And from there, uh, the idea of creating an international court against corruption, because more and more the corruption is multinational. Uh, it's an idea that is starting to to be discussed in the United Nations and, and in certain areas. That could be uh, uh, a complement to the anti-corruption uh, policies that each country should put in place. I mean, there is a, there's an international dimension in at least two, two cases. There's the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act which uh, makes it a crime, say, in the U.S. for a company to bribe abroad. And, um, uh, and, and there are several cases of uh, corrupt practices in Venezuela that are now in, in American jails. And, and there was this whole international impact of the Brazilian Lava Jato uh, scandal where, where information was revealed that um, is, is there now the typical thing that countries have done is to make government procurement more complicated and uh, and, and which, which sometimes feeds corruption no? uh, do you think technology might give us a hand or uh, I mean financial uh, information the, might the, give us the, a hand the best I mean, I, I come from the journalistic world. The th things that the corrupt people fear the most is uh, the lamp of public opinion. And so the more laws that oblige the, con the governments to be transparent, to make the information public, to have the people, the citizens, being able to, to see exactly how they're spending the money and where it goes and how the contracts are made, that helps tremendously. The role of the press, when there's a, a good press, a, an inquisitive press, governments don't like it, but it's necessary. And so there's different factors that, that can contribute to, to fight corruption with more effectiveness. What are the top three most pressing economic challenges facing Colombia today? I would say we need to diversify more the economy. We still are too much dependent on raw materials, basic commodities. Um, we need to increase our productivity. All of Latin America has a problem of productivity. Uh, if you compare uh, the productivity in the Asian countries compared to Latin America, the growth, the com component of productivity in Asia is much, much higher than in, in, in our countries. So there you have, it's, it's a problem, but, it, but it's also an opportunity to grow faster. And I would, again, concentrate more and more in education, because education also helps if you, if you give everybody a, a good and level starting point, you also create more equality. And equality, more equality is also a factor that will contribute to economic growth and to progress. Um, so you says, as an experienced politician, negotiator, peacemaker, and military leader, 
Uh, what do you recommend Juan Guaidó to do to uh, end the dictatorship in Venezuela? I would recommend him to uh, use his courage that he has demonstrated and uh, try to build what they call a golden bridge for the regime that is now in power to go away as soon as possible, but with a golden bridge in a way that they will, uh, if, if people think that Maduro will simply say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going and he ends up in, in a jail like uh, Noriega in Panama, uh, that will never happen. So you have, to, you have to give him a way out, a dignified way out. But in order to do that, you need to uh, bring in the major stakeholders of, of this process, international stakeholders. Who are they? China, Russia, the US, Cuba, and Latin America. And um, if he sits down with, with Maduro and says, we will negotiate, you, you go out and transition, with the major stakeholders uh, backing that, you will then have a peaceful transition because what I fear most is any transition will, which will be violent. Venezuela, and you know that better than anybody, has many, many people armed. Chavez, since the very beginning, followed the Cuban uh, advice of arming the defenders of the revolution. Uh, the institutions have been destroyed. The criminal bands have taken over parts of Venezuela, especially in the rich parts where there's gold, where there's coltan. And uh, in order to be able to control that, uh, you have to avoid violence because if violence erupts, to control that violence will take a long time. I think we probably have time for two more questions. So the first one is from William Yepes. He says, could you explain how Ser Pilo Paga works? And uh, oh, that's a great question because it's my favorite program. Unfortunately, it's so not working. Let me translate it for you. Being a nerd pays off? Or <laughs> yes, <laughs> being a good student. Uh, uh, no. It, it, we, we copied that system from, uh, from Australia. There's a, a similar system in Australia. What, what did we do? The, the, peop, the, the students that graduated with the best uh, grades from the lower strata, the ones that get, got the best grades would have the opportunity to go to the best universities in Colombia and the state will pay for, for the, for the uh, you negotiated with the universities and uh, they got in. The best university in Colombia is probably the Los Andes. 40%, 4 of the new students came because all wanted to go to Los Andes. And they competed with the rich kids from Bogota and of course they won. Their, their, their place in Los Andes. So this is a program that has a tremendous social mobility. It gives the brightest the opportunity to go to the best universities. It improves tremendously the quality of the education where they go to. It's a win-win situation from every point of view. The present government decided to do away with it uh, unfortunately, I, w I must say, because this is one of the best programs, it was criticized because uh, the public, the public uh, university said, well, why do the students go to the best uh, private universities? Well, if you're as good as the private, then they will go to your university. Um, it's a competition. Um, but the way it worked was uh, 40,000 kids we're able to go to the best universities in Colombia from the lower strata. And that not only changed them, they changed the whole families. You cannot imagine the stories 
behind each kid or boy or girl that are now, I, I just came uh, three weeks ago and I, I was a commencement speaker at the graduation of the first promotion of Pilos from Los Andes. And that was a great revolution. So it's a signal that, uh, you know, there is a, an activist policy for social mobility. Well, can you imagine the people from the lower strata having the access to go to the best universities? That, is, that immediately changes their, their lives. Um, uh, this is a question from Jared Kenny from Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, do you still have your drive for journalism? And if so, are there any stories you'd like to have or had the opportunity to cover as a journalist? Well, um, when I was in government, I really missed being a journalist um, because I was uh, a victim of, of, of my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people in government don't understand that, but um, a watchdog, when everything is quiet, when everything is okay, he just sleeps. When he sees something bad, he barks or bites. And the, the journalist, the, uh, when, we, when, when you're in government, you complain, why don't you publish the good things, the good news? Um, it's a bias that journalists have. Um, but it's a necessary bias. And I, I always said that criticism and the and the journalists that were against the government were like a, uh, a bath of cold water in the morning that wakes you up and r makes you realize that you have to work more. Um, what stories would I cover? Ha, huh, the American election. <laughs> it's, it's, it's getting very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> very good. Uh, would you have a piece of advice for any of the candidates running? Uh, um, well, no, it's very difficult to give advice for the candidates. Uh, um, it's, it's, politics now is, is becoming very, uh, very different from traditional politics. When, when Kennedy was elected, no, you saw, you see the museum, the, the debates between Kennedy and Nixon and, and the, the importance of the arguments. In today's world, the emotions took over and the arguments were sort of left to one side. And emotions um, uh, are very easily to manipulate fear and uh, hate and uh, disc discrimination and and, and, and nationalism and uh, me first and uh, these things are are very detrimental to good politics. Politics is transactions. It's not a a, a black and white. It is not uh, it's not a zero sum game. In politics, you give something and and I gave something and we we both agree on something. That's the nature of politics since the Greeks invented democracy. But what you're seeing now is, is the contrary. So I would say that uh, any candidate that can recuperate that type of politics based on principles, on values, and, uh, and the value of, of making transactions in the, in, in, the, in the good sense of making transactions that makes uh, a democracy much, uh, much more effective. In polarization, that the ones that we, we're seeing now in the U.S. and all around the world, in my country also, paralyzes the action of government. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, Thanks up. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your very, very wide-ranging questions. Thank you, President Santos, for your thoughts on so many different issues. And I'm sure that you will come back to this place for another interesting event in the near future. Thank you. And thank you, 
Ricardo, I, I told him, I asked him right before coming in, please have mercy. He had mercy. <laughs> <laughs>